I couldn't boot it all from a, a, a um, USB. Yeah. So I said, aha, uh, that, uh, that must be the, uh, the hardware. Okay. Okay, well, wow. another aha uh -huh gone astray. <laughs> I, mean, I, I didn't read the details of all of that, Richard uh, Dick Maybach, but yeah. it occurred to me that if one tries to build a Linux rig with the absolute latest hardware today, you may encounter not having drivers that work. Um, uh, not an issue for, for anything I did. Yeah, oh, generally well, that, not the case. Possible, but the absence of drivers, you're shaking your head, Sergey. Yeah, generally driver support tends to be very good for some of the very, very obscure hardware. You might have some fallback functionality or yeah. some tuning that you might need to do, but I have never had an experience with new hardware where there wasn't sufficient driver support. Yeah, exception might be uh, some video cards. Uh, yeah, that was the kind that I was thinking of. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, because NVIDIA drivers are proprietary, for example. But they are readily available to be installed in Linux. So, you know, well, that's I have a case. not a barrier. Okay. Hey, Lee. Hey, Lee. Hi. Hey, Lee. Hi, Lee. Cool this is those a... Upgrades. I had a... A couple of weeks ago, after updating uh, Zoom on the Linux machine, it wouldn't connect until I actually rebooted the machine. Oh, so, I've seen Zoom be pretty flaky, yeah. Well, that surprised me because generally uh, applications um, don't don't affect the uh, system to that extent, so long as you. Um, close them down, start them up, they should run okay. But uh, as I had friends in the past, they've run running a Linux server, you know, at a school that's been running for literally months without restarting. They, they're that solid. Whereas their Windows server, they're rebooting them every couple of days. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You were going to say something? Yeah, I have an example of a device that's supposed to be Linux ready. Um, it's called a Gross Trends Chinese company. Uh, it's a, a Wi Fi USB adapter. So you plug in a USB port. Um, yeah. And I've dealt with this before. Um, it's definitely not Linux ready. There are no drivers in a repository. Uh, I had to hook the, the computer up via uh, Ethernet in order to get on the internet at all. And on their website, they have instructions for um, going terminal. Um, Yeah, um, go in the terminal, you know, type in a command that's supposed to download and install the drivers. And I've tried it once before and it didn't work because the drivers weren't where they said it was supposed to be. <laughs> so I'm going to try it again because I just installed uh, Linux Mint Debian on this new um, PC that I'm trying out. And um, hopefully I can find these drivers and download them and get them installed. But it, it, it is annoying that sometimes they, they you know, whoever is saying it's, it's Linux compatible, it isn't. You know, I bought something, it didn't cost much, but I bought something that should have been compatible, it wasn't, you know, do I return it to Amazon? Do I just, you know, muddle through? Oh, well. You said That's that this, this was a USB Wi-Fi adapter? Yes. That you bought separately? Yes. Interesting. And they said in in the Amazon description, it's Linux compatible, and nobody <laughs> said it wasn't. So you, but they didn't also they also didn't say you had to download the drivers that it, that just wouldn't work. Um, uh, maybe you get on Amazon and leave that message and say, "Hey, it's not." I I haven't had time, but I hopefully I can do it this weekend. 
the job is is keep me very busy. This is Gil Brand in Dallas. We had quite a bit of trouble with our uh, master image getting certain Wi-Fi adapters to work, but we found a um, driver for one of the off-brand uh, chipsets. I'll try to find that in my email and uh, post it in the chat here shortly. Thank you. Good. I can remember back in the days when get a new uh, Ubuntu come out and my old laptop, the Wi-Fi adapter was one of those Broadcom something or others and it wouldn't work uh, natively. I'd have to come home from the library where we had a Linux group that would do a install fest and come home, plug it in, get the, you know, download the drivers for it and then Wi-Fi worked fine. Yeah. So I started taking that folder with the Wi-Fi drivers, kept it on a thumb drive, and so I'd be able to go in and install it once I got the new Ubuntu, then it was okay. But nowadays, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it wasn't a problem. You're probably talking about the BCM43 variety, if I remember correctly. That, that, that sounds very close to the number, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to observe that all the problems that you guys have mentioned so far have been with Wi-Fi adapters that yeah, I have yeah. very limited experience with. Yeah. But uh, yeah, because we, we would go over. So, you know, Bill, you'd know, we'd go to downtown to one of the libraries in Columbus. Yeah. And they would let us use a room and gave us Wi-Fi. Okay. And, and I'd put the new Ubuntu on, no Wi-Fi, and there was no way to hardwire it. So right. I had to go home, yeah. hardwire. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think Linux Mint is still that way because um, I had that on an older machine and it had a BCM43 on it. Yeah. So, Dick, did you say you 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 got the new rig built or or no? Oh well, yeah, it's it's done. I'm I'm using it now. Okay. All right. Oh, but I have I... some more work to do. <laughs> okay. I thought you just said that it became unbootable. Oh well, it was on. Yeah, it's it boots with with reluctance. <laughs> I have I have to uh, uh, try several times, but my old uh, the old motherboard uh, was an old BIOS, and so there was no dance on the F12 switch to tell it to to boot from the USB. It just decided uh, it was going to do that or not. And since Ubuntu hadn't shut down properly, Ubuntu was still running. And I guess the motherboard figured, okay, uh, USB, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't even look at that. We'll just go back to Ubuntu. So until I managed to get Ubuntu to properly shut down, I, I couldn't run anything. Now, the, the, the new scheme, I haven't tried it yet because I'm, <laughs> I didn't want to do anything until after this talk is over. Uh, but when the talk is over, I'll shut down and see if I can boot from a USB, and then I can uh, reinstall my uh, Ubuntu. Usually okay. you can repair boots, broken boots in various places. But, I, I mean, tried you that. to troubleshoot. <laughs> and it said, uh, nope. It uh, is well, working fine. There is there is no problem with... with uh, oh, well, I mean, the canned troubleshooters are not... Yeah, yeah, particularly yeah. useful. They they make guesses at what might be wrong. You really need yeah, to I, diagnose I, I the told problem it to, yourself. To uh, uh, re rewrite the, the bootloader, and it said it did that. So the yeah. the problem is is not in the bootloader. I think the problem is in Ubuntu itself. So are you getting to a grub prompt? Uh, I had the grub prompt, and, and, then, and uh, I, I and rewrote then... grub, and it didn't help. Well, hold on. So you you can get a grub prompt with like difficulty. Can, <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that means. It means it takes several tries in order to to get back to a a grub prompt. Okay. It's just it's just flaky, it's, it's, it's mm. Sergey. And so so, but I'm, I'm hopeful now that I can reboot uh, from a USB and then reinstall. Uh, uh, Ubuntu. I have, fortunately, I have my uh, 
my home directory is is on a, a separate partition. And so I can reinstall wow. Ubuntu and, and not clobber my home directory. Right. Well, if you don't have a large amount of effort invested in configuring it, it may well be easier to reinstall. But usually you can repair broken things. I know, but so far I haven't had, I've had no luck. <laughs> well, you know, drop me a line. I'll be happy to help. Okay. Well, let me, let me charge into it. And uh, tomorrow I'll either be, I'll either be cheering or crying. <laughs> I, I generally think it's interesting to repair broken machines because you tend to learn something every time you do. So, yep. you know, yep. I, I'm happy to do that for, as it, for entertainment value. <laughs> Well, I've, I've learned far more than I intended already. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, usually it's, you know, one, you, you either cannot get to Grub or Grub cannot load the kernel or Grub cannot load the initial RAM disk. Well, you know, well, or once, once that's loaded, then there's you, then you can have a problem during the boot sequence somewhere right yeah i haven't seen anything like this before you know where ubuntu come, comes up and it gives me just we're we're doing something we're doing something but it never quite gets to the uh the, the uh, active part of it i'm, I'm always it always it's always in in process huh. so i had just done a uh up, update right and so i think the update uh, must have gone sour at some point So you're saying that it boots, but it claims that it's got an update in process that it no, needs no, to it, recover? It, it boots, and I get the Ubuntu screen. I get the Ubuntu screen that, that you get when you're waiting for Ubuntu to fully load. You mean the, you mean the login GUI? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, the, the login is gone. Uh, you know, it's like I'd, I'd already logged in, but I haven't yet. You know, I turn the thing on. It looks like it's partway through a, a boot when I, I, I turn it on. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> I have on Windows. Oh. Oh. Now, when the Windows is a, is a different group, we can talk about Linux this time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, Windows know. is not all that different. In how no, I know. I know. It, I know. Yeah. You know, yeah. It just all, has a lot of those. Hang on, I'll be with you in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah I mean, the, the, uh, I, I hope that maybe you'll write a quick description of where what the problem was and how you solved it, Dick, uh, no. and post that I, for the group. That's I haven't a solved useful it yet. thing. My, <laughs> my next step is going to be bull in the china shop. You know, I'm just going to uh, put put in the Ubuntu install disk. And one of the options, if you have your your home directory on a separate partition, is redo it. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, that's well, that, that reminds me. There's a joke that I saw. Uh, I guess it was on Facebook. Uh, many of you may have frying pans the bottom of which becomes a total mess with baked on oil. Yeah. And so this guy went through <laughs> describing how he tried to clean and he had a picture of the baked on one and then a shiny clean one next to it. And he went through and led you through the steps that he tried to clean the whole thing. And then he said, and then I went out and bought a new one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, it looks like sometimes Fred, that is the best course of action. But looks like Fred is having trouble joining. Hmm. No, I just clicked on the wrong thing. That's oh, you clicked on. Okay, yeah, yeah, there you are. Okay. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be the whole night. I have to. Uh, prep That's for okay. Oh, no. We are recording this, so we'll have something for posterity. <laughs> <laughs> There is going to be evidence. Yes, we love evidence. And, and you know, you did a good job, Fred, of chopping out the important parts or keeping the important parts of the last meeting when you posted them. That's pretty good. So, That's what the editor does. I, I, I got that, man. Believe me, I got it. You know, I got the, um, <clears throat> the, the one story I have is uh, yesterday, our seniors club here in town had a guest speaker 
Uh, <clears throat> his name is Bob Wilson, also known as Dr. Robert Wilson, yeah. the Nobel Prize winner. And he gave a talk on basically his professional life and the Big Bang Theory and uh, all that good stuff and the horn antenna here in Homedale. And I had someone record it. Uh, so I have to go through and I have to stabilize the image since it, well, he didn't have a tripod available. So, yep, yeah, editing is always fun. <laughs> All right. Um, I think it's will masochism. You send, will but... you send me a link to that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I will uh, distribute that link uh, widely, believe me. Yes, thank you. Many, many people have uh, expressed an interest in that. I just have to go through some stabilization processes with shortcut. So I learned a new thing. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, John Stanford, I don't know what your camera's doing, but I see a blur of stuff of different colors. Oh, there you are. That's better. I don't know what you were doing, but <laughs> and you're and you're muted. Oh, you're talking. You're talking to mute, John. Now you have nobody on your head's the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if he has a little cover over over the camera. You know. Yeah, I kind of wonder that too. Yeah, you gotta love it, man. There yeah. are oh. there are there's an app uh, in Power Tools for Windows. Okay. Which won't help anybody, but maybe there's also one for Linux that shuts off, that mutes you and shuts off your camera. Oh, you know? okay. Well, your camera is currently showing yeah. yellow and dark blue. Yeah. yeah. Sort of a messy pattern. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I don't know if that's intended. Yes, I said it is. <laughs> we did oh. see it there for a minute. Yeah. What, what's, the, what's the name of that? Oh, it's, it's part of Power Tools, you said. Power Toys? Yeah, Windows okay. Power Toys has that okay. in it. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Fun stuff, man. All right. Is that pattern supposed to be representative of something? <laughs> no, it is accidental. I just grabbed something that would stick over the uh, camera and slid oh. it over. And it turned yeah. out to be an amusing pattern to me. So <laughs> I use a posted, but... <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> uh, you got to love it. Looks like okay. an old candy wrapper to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Anyway, so I, I think being 23 minutes into it, we're probably at the point where either um, uh, Dick or Sergey can talk and have some words. Hey. Dick, you want to go first? Sure, I can do it. Go for it, man. Okay. I'm recording. I've been recording for a while. Um, first of all, yeah, how, how I got started on this, I I started like everybody does, I guess, uh, using uh, uh, Windows and Linux in a dual boot scheme. And I didn't care for it because it requires repartitioning the host network, the host system, and uh, that's hazardous, you know. If if you screw it up, you 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 clobbered your your home system. And uh, the recently, Microsoft added features to Windows. That means sometimes when you uh, update Windows, you can disable your your Linux, which is inconvenient. And finally, if you switch down, if you switch between one and the other, then you uh, your you can't access the files. On the other machine without some not some uh, uh, calisthenics. So I built a new system. This was maybe 12 years ago, uh, and I designed it especially to support virtual machines. It has the right features in the uh, the CPU, and I set it up so that my host was Linux, and the only Windows I had was on a virtual machine. And of course, I use VirtualBox because that's what everybody uses, and it, it works well. And uh, everything was fine. Then some years later, VirtualBox began to have problems with uh, Linux guests. And uh, their answer to the complaints was, well, look, uh, uh, VirtualBox is open source. 
why don't you Linux guys fix it because we don't have the resources. So at, at that point, my fix was to switch to KVM because I figured that this was a core business for IBM and uh, Red Hat, and they were probably more interested in uh, supporting Linux guests than, uh, than Oracle was. So that's, that's what I use now. I use a, a QEMU KVM for all my Linux guests, but I keep VirtualBox for Windows because uh, Windows works better as a guest, as a VirtualBox guest, than it does as a KVM guest. The main problem is that uh, uh, file sharing is inconvenient with OEM and Windows. And you have to set up a Samba share on the guest and on the host. And uh, the uh, default network setup, uh, the guest can't see the host on, on the network. So it involves some calisthenics that I didn't see any reason to go through since I already had it working well in a virtual box. Dick, question. Yeah. I was under the impression that at least at one time you could not have both AVM and VirtualBox installed. Absolutely. Well, you can have them installed. You can't run them at the same time. I thought there were that they both try to load conflicting kernel drivers, but if they're running, I see. But but if they're not running, you can switch back and forth. It's not a problem. But but running, you're right. They're competing for the same resources, and uh, it's an ugly uh, confrontation. I I haven't tried it. I I, I read the reports that okay, that's something I'm just not going to do. Okay, uh, where are we? The uh, a limitation, of course, is that KVM only runs on Linux hosts. If your host is Windows, then you're along for the ride on this talk. Uh, VirtualBox requires extension packs in order to do copy paste, video acceleration, and file sharing. So whenever you update uh, the uh, the host or the guest, you have to update that extension pack. Now, uh, KVM has no extension pack, uh, so it you don't have this this uh, problem. But on KVM, you do have to mount uh, the shared uh, directory or the shared partition. Um, each time you boot KVM, each time you boot the the, uh, the guest. So, but that's a minor thing. Let's I'll talk about that when we get into the talk. Okay, uh, let me uh, share my screen here. Uh, And hopefully I'm doing it. I see a screen. Okay. Yeah, looks good. All right. So the, the references are, I, I did uh, uh, write up a column in 2021 that basically is the same material that uh, I'm going to talk about here. Uh, a couple of things have changed. Uh, one thing is on the original column, I talked about setting up a virtual memory stick where the memory stick has uh, uh, a persistent uh, memory. And uh, I'm not gonna cover that because it's a kind of a, it's involved to set up and it's already in the article. If you do a, uh, uh, a search for a vert manager on, uh, on uh, the internet, you'll find a lot of good stuff. Do a search for KVM or QEMU, you, most of the articles you find are gonna be for people who are running uh, uh, commercial uh, systems. And so it's gonna be highly technical and probably not something you, you can use. So what you really want is Vert, Ma Vert Manager, which is what I use, it's the, uh, uh, the graphical interface. Okay. Now to install it, this is what I went through. This is on, on Ubuntu. Of course, it's a little bit different if you don't have a Debian-based system. But uh, up, update the apt, um, install QEMU, KVM, live, anyway, the, all these packages here. You may not need all of these, 
but uh, they don't hurt anything and uh, you, you probably use them uh, sooner or later. You have to add your add the, your user, uh, that's the user is you, your, your uh, login. Uh, to, uh, you have to add that to the Libvirt group and the KVM group. Okay, and then uh, you have to, to check that the uh, libvintd service is running. And you have to start the virtual, you can start the virtual machine from the command line with sudo virt manager, but it should be uh, on your uh, uh, graphical, uh, there should be an icon there. You can just, just click on it. And you, uh, again, you have to add your username to these groups, which I, I guess I've, that's redundant. I've done that twice. All right. So not all of these may be needed, but it's helpful. Now, let me just go to the, the manager. This is how the virtual machine manager looks. Uh, let me get this out of the way because we don't need, well, I'll leave it there. Uh, so you can see what you've installed. It's very similar to uh, uh, virtual box. There's a list of things that, that you've installed. A double click doesn't start anything. All it does is connect a window to the, uh, the, the graphics of the virtual machine, virtual machine. If we select the light bulb, then we can see the, the characteristics of the uh, uh, virtual machine. Um, so the, in this case, it's, it's uh, Fedora. You see, I'm running four CPUs. Um, these are actually our threads. I only have six CPUs on machines, so I'm running two CPUs with two threads each. Uh, and you could go down here through the normal things. The same, it's pretty much the same things you'll find on uh, VirtualBox. Uh, I'm running uh, eight gigs of memory. Uh, I used to run four, but since I've got it, I'm going to use it. Uh, I only have one boot option here. And in um, any case, there's nothing loaded in the uh, virtual CD-ROM. So it's the same setup. Uh, the same uh, things that you see on uh, virtual box to get us started. Uh, you, you, Dick, can yes. you can you look at the networking? Yeah. Um, are the options the same or are they different? Uh, you know, I don't do a whole lot with networking. I just use the uh, where it says Nick just below CD-ROM. Wait, 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 wait. Displays by some right sure. below. Right below the highlight, right below the CD-ROM. Oh, okay. So is that? This is what the is, default. It, what's it's, the device model? I can't tell you. Um, so VirtualBox can do this in the uh, NAT mode where nothing can access the, the virtual machine. Or, yeah, I do a bridge. Ah, there it is. Okay, okay, so you can bridge. You can do bridge. A, I, I haven't done or it. Or doing that. Yet. Okay. You know, I, I have a, a thirst for adventure, but it's limited. Okay. <laughs> so if you don't bridge it, then it is, assuming it works the same way as it does with VirtualBox, if yeah. you don't bridge it, you won't be able to see the virtual machine on the network from other machines. That's, that's right. You just look back. You're just lo looking out at the internet. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. In in the the meantime, Fedora has has booted. So you, it's just, you know, it's Fedora, but it's just like VirtualBox. Dick, can you go back a moment on the video? I I read that you need to have this driver QXL. Can you briefly explain why? Yeah, you let need me let me. Uh, I don't believe you need anything like that. Let's see. Yeah. Let me, in fact, I'm going to set up a new virtual machine now. Okay. So let me do, uh, do that. And I'll, I'll go through what I normally do when I, I, I set it up. Uh, okay, so we're going to turn this off. Um, are, the, are there options for going full screen video? 
at native resolution or is, yeah, is yes, the yes, video yes. limited? Yes, no, it's, uh, this is the option here. I see. I was and under it, the impression that at least at one point there was limited support for graphics cards in KVM. I haven't, I haven't run into that. Okay. Uh, if you if you do go to um, full screen video, then you go up here, you move the cursor up, and then here's how you you get back. Right. So it's a you have to read that before you get started. Otherwise, you're in full screen video and you, you can't get out. <laughs> Looks nice though. Okay, so let me shut this down. What is the name of the virtual machine software that you're using? It's KVM. Um, okay, so let me, I'm gonna now, oops, I covered that. No, I didn't. What? I'm, I know I'm lost. Eight. Oh, okay. One more. Here we go. So to create a, a new machine, you click on the icon. It's very much like VirtualBox. Okay, I'm going to use a local media install. I've got an ISO image set up. Go forward. I want to browse my local. And in the downloads, and I thing I'm going to use is MX. Uh, 21.3 for no particular reason. It's just there and I know it works. Okay, so we go forward. Oops. I have to tell it what kind of operating system is going to, to be there. There are several models to choose from. And um, I'm going to pick, where did it go? Linux generic. Come on, where are you? Let me pick something else. G-E-N, generic Linux. This is not terribly important. All we're doing is we're setting up the defaults for the configuration. But this, if you pick the right one, you, you get a start. Okay. Now, default is 4096 in memory. I, this machine, I normally set it up to uh, eight gigs. CPUs, I normally increase that by two. 25 gigabits or, or gigabytes is small. I usually set that for 50. Okay, we go forward and we're almost set, except I wanna make one customization. And that is on the display. Whoops. Uh, no, that's okay. Display. Here we go. On the, the video. The VIR to DO is an, a nice display. It has 3D acceleration, but it can cause problems. I found that QXL, which has no acceleration, is safer. And uh, if you run into video problems during the install, it's a real nuisance. You have to stop and start over again. Uh, so I'm going to switch to QSL. I'm going to apply that. And we're going to in, uh, install. And here we go. Come on. Okay, so we, we're now running a, a virtual machine and we could, could finish the installation, but you've all gone through that. So you know what it is, it takes, it takes a while and I'm not gonna finish. I just wanted to show that getting the thing started, we're now right where we'd be with, a, with real hardware. We've booted from the USB 
and we're looking at the uh, the uh, guess machine. So this is is MX um, Linux. Okay, that's all I'm going to do with that. I'll shut off the display. <laughs> Dick Fred here um, on, on the uh, allotment of uh, of uh, disk space. You said fifty gig. Is there yes. such a thing with this? Um, virtual machine that is you set up a dynamic virtual hard drive like you do with virtual box no you, you <laughs> the size is fixed as far as i can tell fixed mm -hmm. yeah well but i think fred's question is does it immediately allocate all 50 gigs you or know, or they, I, or does it allocate it on demand as as it grows and is well, there any advantage I haven't, I haven't looked to see uh, honestly, um, I, I figure I have to uh, um, have the space available, and so uh, I haven't, wor haven't worried about it. Okay, we're now we're running Linux 2020, so I'm going to shut shut this down you, you should be able to look in the settings and see what the amount of storage actually used currently is if you've got a machine running i, I don't know if i can let me uh settings Can't you run top or something like that to give you the amount of disk use? Of I might be able to because you know I've I've shut the machine off now. I I, I killed the uh, uh, the install, and so uh, I uh, I can't I can't tell you what uh, uh, how much is actually is being used. Okay. Let it me. is usually an option to say allocate all the space or grow it as needed up to this limit. I haven't seen that that option, John. Um, all all I see is in the the setup is to create the size of the disk, and I know that 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 exists with the uh, virtual box, but I haven't run into it. it. If it's if it's there, it's hidden somewhere that I haven't run uh. into yet. According to a quick Google, this is this format, the QCAL2 format is yeah. dynamically allocated always. Okay. I just Thanks, pasted okay. the Google search link into the chat if you guys want to yeah. read that. All so, right. So as far as I can tell, pre-allocating is statically is simply not an option. It's always dynamic. Okay. Well, I'm going to um Start my Fedora again. Because what I wanted to show <clears throat> here is uh, setting up uh, shared memory or shared shared storage. And to do that, you have to go to the configuration. And here I've uh, uh, I have a if I can find it now. I've added added hardware, added hardware. I told her I wanted to add a file system. And uh, in order to uh, do that, I would go in here. In fact, let me, the steps are here. Let me, let me put, it, put it down. Um, so that I'm, Ah, uh, come on, where are you? Nope. Okay. Here are the steps to create a share. You select add, add hardware. Then you select file system. The driver is uh, VARTIO9P. It 
okay, the, the uh, source path, you choose a, uh, or a directory on your, uh, uh, your host. I've always used VM share. And then the target path is the name of the um, directory on your, your guest. And that's going to be host share. And then I would just finish that. I'm going to abort this because I've already done it. And uh, where did it go? Here it is. VARTAO 9P. Here's the host target path. So this has already been done. What's and the advantage of to... using that rather than using like a network mount or an SSHFS? Yeah, then I don't have to. If I use this, I don't have to uh, configure the uh, the uh, network. It works just like um, VirtualBox does. Right. But I do have to to mount it, and uh, ah. Okay. And to mount it, I have a, a, um, where did it go? Nope. Huh. Where did it? Oh, here it is. I have to run this this uh, command, so it's just a matter of copying this command, going to uh, the terminal, and pasting it in. Okay, and now if I go to VM to uh, VM share, I, I see the uh, uh, the directory. This is the directory on my host. So it is now available to the uh, uh, the uh, guest. So it, once you you uh, run this uh, this short command line program, it now works the same as VirtualBox, but unlike VirtualBox, it doesn't show up automatically every time you boot. Okay. Ah. Now the yeah. next thing, I'll shut this down. I mean, you could certainly set up the virtual machine to do the mount during boot. Just stick you it in your FS could. tab. Yeah, I I didn't, sir, Gay, because I want to run sometimes two virtual machines at once. I'm mm -hmm. not sure what happens if two virtual machines are linked to the same uh, uh, directory on the host. So I thought I would just avoid. Avoid the issue for now in any way and, uh, and not have do it automatically. Be interesting to find out. I would expect that all accesses would go through the host's file system permissions and therefore you should be pretty safe. Yeah. You do have to, unlike VirtualBox, you do have to worry file permissions here because Windows, of course, doesn't understand permissions and uh, Linux does. So every time you transfer a file from the host to the uh, uh, virtual machine, you have to set up, you have to make the uh, per, the permissions permissive. Uh, okay. Now, I'm going to go into, and I'm going to, to set it up to boot from a, uh, a ISO live image. And to do that, Go to this, the virtual CD-ROM, SATA CD-ROM, and uh, browse local. And it's in downloads. Uh, I have, I think I'll run Canoptics. It's kind of fun. Apply that. Now I go into the boot options. 
I want to, to turn on that, uh, um, oops, whoops, whoops, that's the wrong one. I want to turn on the SATA CD-ROM. So that is going to boot first before it tries to boot uh, from the uh, VITIO disk, which is, is um, Fedora. So here we go. Yes, I forgot to click apply. And we come up with, with Nopix instead of Fedora. It's not through booting yet. They've got a little dance to do. So you can, can run uh, these uh, ISO images just as though they, just, just as though they were um, uh, physical uh, uh, CD-ROMs or, or DVDs on a, uh, a, a uh, physical machine. Okay, end of that. Um, and log out. If I reboot, it should come back. Oh no, it's, this is not going to do what I want it to. All right, let me uh, just sh shut this down. Ah, oh, come on. I have to be more more firm with it. The other interesting thing you can do is you can boot from a physical um, memory stick. So let's do, now I'm gonna go into my setup. I'm gonna uh, SATA CD-ROM. I'm gonna kill that. I'm gonna add hardware. I'm gonna add a USB host device. And I've just plugged in this SanDisk memory stick. Now I go back to uh, the boot options. Oops, I got to click apply again. I don't want to do this, but I do want to, whoops, here. I want to boot first from the memory stick. And that happens to be a Ventoy stick. This is the stick that I have all my uh, uh, rescue uh, uh, systems on. So I have, my favorite is Partition Magic. And so it's now booting from a physical uh, memory stick. And it takes a, a little while. It's quite an involved program that loads it, the whole memory stick into RAM before it starts. Come on, baby, you can do it. Here we go. Okay, so now we're running Parted Magic, or nearly so, as soon as the, the dancing balls calm down. So this is my, my go-to uh, maintenance uh, software here. And I, I've written this up a couple of times. Okay, so now uh, we are up on this. 
in this case, if I if I restart the computer, I should go back to the the Ventoy. Yes, and so if I wanted to try a second tool, it's here on the uh, the Ventoy stick. Okay. Oops, let me let me put this before I leave this. I want to uh, unscrew my. Uh, um, let's see what here's a USB. Yes, and one thing uh, that I you have to do is if you've used a a, a USB and if you unplug it. The next time I try to boot, it'll see that that USB is missing and it will uh, raise an error. So let's get rid of that memory stick. Okay. Did that, did that. File locations. Uh, unlike VirtualBox, VirtualBox locates all the files on the, your home directory. Uh, the, the default for KVM is here in the systems area, slash var, slash libs, slash libvirt. And this is where everything is. It says implications uh, for uh, sizing your system partition because now you're gonna need space, not only for the system, but for the, all your virtual machines. And also the implications for your, your backup. I back up only my home directory, but now I back up also this area. Uh, and so the, the key uh, uh, area in here is a, a file called, or a directory called images, where all of the uh, virtual machines are stored. The rest of this is, set up for KVM. I did find that, um, let's see, ah, oh, okay. If I go on. I did find a problem once when I updated Ubuntu. Some of the virtual machines wouldn't run. And it's, uh, there is a tighter link between the guest and the host on KVM than there is in VirtualBox. And so some of the changes uh, when I updated uh, Ubuntu disabled my virtual machines. So I had to, to go back and this was the procedure. I had to uh, delete the problem guests. You have to be careful because deleting a problem guest also deletes the file uh, back here in, uh, uh, in images. So you first have to save a copy out of here if you want to restore this. And then uh, you restore the problem guest, just the uh, the file in, in uh, images. So you would, for example, if I wanted to, to restore Debian, I would restore this file, Debian-11.3, like QCAL2. Because all of the guests have the extension QCAL2. Then using the virtual machine manager, I would recreate the problem guests by importing their disk images. And then I would uh, update them. Now, to, it's not, to create a, a file from a, a, a image, you have to do a slightly different procedure. When we did this before, I, we went to, uh, I installed from a local install medium with the ISO image, but now you change that. You want to import an existing disk image. The reference for this, by the way, is, is here. And uh, you're going to need the reference if you're going to do this because it's fairly involved. Then in this case, he wanted to, uh, to uh, locate the image and this is, this is where it was. I wouldn't do it this way. I would move this image to the images area in the uh, so the where the default is. That is back up where was it here? 
because this this is if you put it in place else, you're going to complicate your your backup process. So anyway, I would use uh, the images here instead of this oddball directory. Then, you, as usual, you set up the memory and the number of CPUs. You want to name it, but notice you want to customize this before you install. And then you want to set up the advanced option. The disk bus wants to be SATA. Then you apply. Then the, the, the default network is BIRTIO. Apply. Then you begin installation and it, it proceeds uh, pretty much normally after that. Okay. So to, to wrap things up, let me get rid of this. In fact, uh, I don't want to save anything. Uh, where did where did my screen go? Oh, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, to wrap things up, um, the KBM QEMU. When used with Virtual Machine Manager, works much like VirtualBox. If you use it with the uh, the command line, it's far different and far more involved. And frankly, I'm not competent to do that. Uh, installing the new operating system, much like installing one on a physical PC or on VirtualBox. You can boot from the live images or physical memory sticks. It's available for most Linux distributions. I don't know if all, but you can import KVM VirtualBox and v VMware virtual machines using the same procedure that I, we just I just showed you. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, sir. You're Thank welcome. you. Dave. That was Thanks. very interesting. Yeah, very good, very useful. Good stuff. Yeah. Almost makes me want to take my old machine and convert it like Dix is, just so I can play. Hmm. Well, yeah, as know. he said, you, you can you can just use the existing image in whatever format it's in, or convert it. Yeah. Or utilities yeah. in both VirtualBox and KVM to convert between different yes. disk image formats yeah. as well. Right. Yep. Yeah. Cool. I noticed that you recommended not using the accelerated video. And I think that's what my recollection of with video issues was that you don't necessarily have the full ability to use your accelerated video card in with yeah, KVM. I, 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 I've done it, Sergey. It works with, with many distributions, but I prefer to do it after I do the installation. Oh, you, you can, can switch it after they install? Yeah, oh, yes. Yes, you can go okay. back and you can change it any any time. You can... Uh, the easy things to do are just like virtual box. You can increase the RAM. You mm -hmm. can increase the number of, of uh, threads. Increasing guess... the uh, disk size is less straightforward with both. <laughs> oh, well. But all of these things sound like they're very similar to the way that you would do it phys with physical hardware. Yes. And there are certainly ways to grow your physical hardware size, including storage. Yes. Yes. Or swap things out. Yes. Okay. Any other comments, questions, observations? Yeah, my, the, the one the one caveat is you got to be careful when you do the uh, searches on the internet because if you look for KVM, you're going to be intimidated uh because it's it's highly technical and all all command line stuff and it's not obvious it assumes you know an awful lot about linux and about uh an awful lot about linux and about kvm okay great well hey we got the uh, recording so is there One is there anybody I who has a reason other than trying out a different distro why you would be running a virtual machine I think Sergey, you you sometimes have this for uh, having a server or a router or something. Um, generally, I run virtual machines for experiments, if and that's pretty much it. 
Well, and of course for Windows. Yeah. Um, other than that, not really. I mean, if I need to run something that is machine or OS specific, I'll tend to use Docker rather than a virtual machine. I use I use it for for Windows because I don't. My only thing I use Windows for is TurboTax. Yeah. And updating the the firmware on my GPS devices and my camera. Uh, and I, I say I, I don't like to to use uh, uh, dual booting because every time you upgrade one of those machines, it's 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 a problem. Yeah. And uh, by using uh, virtual machines, I have Windows running when I need it. And when I update Windows, it can take its two or three hours to update as it seems to do. And I just minimize the the virtual machine and go on about my business. Uh, whereas if you had a a uh, a uh, dual boot, you would be out of luck while Windows was uh, was updating. Yeah. I recently built had an occasion to build multiple Windows 11 machines and you know put them in use and I found a reference on the web that claimed that actually to get all the Windows updates applied, you're expected to leave your machine running and unattended for at least 24 hours. Yes. Yes, that is that is the recommendation. Even if you're just running Windows, you should yep. leave your machine up overnight, patch Tuesday, and uh, sometime. Mm -hmm. But you should leave your Windows machine running 24-7 anyway. There's no reason to shut it down unless you don't use it, but once every two or three days. Well, I, I tend to shut mine off every every night just to avoid problems that there's a power glitch. I, I am totally amused that Microsoft continues to supply, to supply more and more reasons not to use Windows. <laughs> Let me ask a question about having a Windows in the virtual machine on Linux. Um, if the hardware was previously registered as an official Windows user, 10 or 11, and then you uh, change it to a Linux machine and put that um, uh, Windows image in as a virtual machine. Does the um, do you, are you still registered as a, as a real user in that case? What Windows sees is is the virtual machine hard, uh, hardware. Oh, see, I virtual... would think if I tried to move my Windows image yeah. from from VirtualBox to KVM, I would be talking to some person in Southeast Asia. Uh, and trying to convince them I wasn't, uh, I hadn't moved Windows to a different machine. Okay, okay. So yeah, but I, but I've upgraded uh, Ubuntu numerous times. But and, you have uh, moved Windows to a different machine. Uh, yes, you have. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but you really yeah. have moved Windows to a different machine. It's a different virtual machine, yes. but it is different. Yeah. It's different. Okay. Thank you. In general, you can still use the Windows registration in a virtual machine that you would use on your, your your regular Windows box. You may have to, you know, you know, re-enter it, but you can you can do that. I've done that. Okay. Uh, Interesting. I see both John Kennedy and Drew have their hands up. Drew, why don't you go first? Um, I was just gonna ask the question about. Windows license, that was my question, was Windows licensing in the virtual machine. Okay. Um, I use Microsoft's developer machines. Um, you can go, they, they pre-prepare, uh, I don't know if people know it, Windows 11 in a virtual machine in VirtualBox and VMware formats. And it's a fully functional Windows 11 machine uh, that's good for about three months before it expires, in case anybody wants to tinker with Windows mm -hmm. 11. Interesting. Uh, let's see. John was the next one with his hand up. Yeah, I was just going to comment about uh, for the other John asking, uh, why would you do it? And what I've been kind of taught uh, in discussions is that it's always good to have the same operating system that you are running in a virtual machine. So if you wanted to try to install something or do something, do it first on the virtual machine. Yeah. And if everything goes fine, do it on, on the real machine. 
And, uh, you know, that would be the same thing for people who are Windows people having a copy of the Windows version they're using as a virtual, try the updates first. And if they don't pose the machine, then go ahead and do the updates on the real machine. Yeah. Boy, most of us like to live a lot more risky than that. <laughs> in, in spite of acquired wisdom. Yeah, right. right. Um, my problem is that it typically doesn't hose the machine. What it does is destroy some feature that you need, but don't use for a week. And when you try to use it, you then discover it's hosed. Yeah. So, your yeah. problem. I love it. Uh, Gil, you had your hand up? Yes. Uh, Richard, you said you go back to Windows for TurboTax. Uh, that's disheartening to me as a new convert convert to uh, Linux of about one year now. I was just about ready to throw away my Windows machine, and now it's tax season. Yep. You tell me that I really don't want to use one of the uh, tax programs from Linux. If you want to use uh, TurboTax, you can use it online and uh, get your taxes done pretty efficiently. That's what I've done for the last couple of years, and I'll probably do it again this year. Yeah, I, I have some complications, Bruce, that make my, my TurboTax involved. And, and so um, I go ahead. In fact, I, I, I buy the, the updated uh, version of TurboTax just so I can, can keep myself sane. Okay. Thanks for the answer. I like the online version. That sounds like a good option for me. Yeah. Well, you can certainly try it in parallel. Yeah. Can I ask a dumb question? There are no dumb questions. You know that. Come on. I have a few. Uh, how do you <laughs> raise your hand? Um, that's a good question. How do you raise? You go. Your you go down. Oh, I've, people. I've people never. Do. I've never quite been so polite, but you know. Well, I'm used what? to it for our workshops. Yeah. How do some you do some it? folks are inspiring that way. Yeah. You go down to where it says reactions on your toolbar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Found it. Thank you. Recognize. Hand, okay. Recognize hand gestures. <laughs> cool. See, that's why we do this. We learn stuff all yeah. the time. So, Second you know, left we need to do that because on some of our workshops, if you have, you know, 150, you can't see everybody. Yeah, and if yeah. they raise their hand and they're on screen six, yeah, you're not going to see them. So we tell them, yep. you know, use that because uh, Bill, when you do that, it puts them at the top of the participant list. Um, okay. And so okay. you can see who had their hand up first. You don't have to say, yeah. well, yeah. let's see, yeah. we got two people. Well, you would have known that my hand was up first and then Drew's. So that, that's just one advantage when it's a big okay. room. So look yeah. at the participant list, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, my eyes were a little bit blurry, but I thought that second one from the left was a middle finger and not a raised thumb. So I. <laughs> I've got one of those on my phone that I can use for text. <laughs> I love it. It's very important stuff. Hey, that's it, man. Gotta that's gotta it. have a gotta have the important functionality. Absolutely. So, uh, the the Jersey salute. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, so I guess that Dick, thank you. That was great. Uh, Sergey, it's your turn. Is it? Yeah. Whatever. All right. Oops, wait a minute. Fred has his hand up. Yes, Fred. All right. Yeah, I was just, just testing out a keyboard shortcut on raising your hand. Oh, okay. All right. That's good. Alt Y. Alt Y. What is it? Alt, alt what? Alt Y as in yellow. Oh, alt I know. Thank you. Good. Wow. Alt There's Y efficiency. as in yelling. Yelling. I want to yelling. talk. Yelling. Yes. Okay. Hey, Andy, uh, Andy was just yelling at me. Yeah, okay, Andy. I'm clicking. Uh -huh. There he goes. You got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Your screen. Uh, is this thing big enough? Or shall I make it bigger? Make it, make it bigger. Please make it bigger if you can, yes. Uh, we have that technology. You know, presenters really should learn how to use the magnifier so that the thing that they're trying to show, they can magnify, like all of your icons on the left, who cares about them now? We really want to magnify the text. Yeah. So 
you could just set the terminal to have a larger font. Can I interrupt for one quick second? Sure. All of the people that are reviewing, watching the screen like I am, if you go to the top of your screen to where you see view options, you can increase the zoom ratio to 200 or even 300. And then you'll have a little hand on the screen. You can drag the screen over so that the screen, the icons are not even on the desktop. And you'll see the terminal full screen. Yeah, that, that helps, but it doesn't help if somebody is moving around the screen a lot. No. All right, so last time we cloned a Git repo and we added some files and then we added some more files and this is kind of where we left things off, right? So we committed some files, right? We added some stuff here and before that we cloned from the Git repo at GitHub Right. And so currently we have a file that we've added, but we haven't done anything else with it. So it's sitting in the working directory. It's not in the index at all. And I'm going to just leave it that way for now. Uh, so there's a couple of different directions that we could go. Uh, we could kind of explore the idea of working on several independent sub-projects at the same time. This, this idea is called branching, where you could have several separate lines of development going on more or less simultaneously, or we can kind of gear this towards people that are using this for individual work where they're not all that likely to be working on multiple things simultaneously and instead talk about multiple repos and how they interact with each other, right? But uh, before we go there, maybe we should look at how to move between different views. So currently, as shown by the git status command, um, we're looking at the latest revision in, a, in our working directory, right? But let's say that I wanted to go back and kind of look at what happened in this revision right here, okay? So I'm just gonna copy the first few characters of this commit ID, and I'm gonna say git checkout, boom. And as you can see, I got a big note that I've switched to this revision, but I'm also not in any, I'm also kind of in the middle of a tree, which is, which is what Git terms detached head. So it's a nice way to examine things, but you probably don't want to be doing, changing things here without, uh, actually doing some stuff to create a new branch. So, and we, we can talk about new branches later, uh, but for example, if I wanted to see what's different between this revision and the last one, right, we can see that well, I kind of did this in reverse. The head with a carrot at the end says, hey, this is previous revision. So I wanted to know what's, the, what's different between the current and the previous. And it showed me to go from the current back to the previous, we've removed some lines from draw.io. And we also removed some lines from this other file from solve.py, right? Or I could reverse the differences Right, and see these lines added. Right, so this may be a little hard to visualize. Uh, so maybe we can pull up a GUI. This is a very simple GUI client that comes with Git. There are whole lots and lots of others. Um, so this shows me this part of my log since I 
moved backwards in time to a previous revision other than the latest one, it doesn't show me the latest revision in the repo, right? It only shows me the current revisions that I can see. And it shows me these differences that we were seeing before. And it shows me the commit message and basically tells me that I'm living in, back in January 26th around 9 p.m. Right. What was, here, the name of, what was the name of this command that brought up the GUI? Git K. Ah, Git K. Yep. There is lots and lots of other Git GUIs, and, they, and you can certainly look at those. Uh, another way, other than from the command line, to move through the revisions and just examine changes is just to click right through here. As you can see, I'm clicking on earlier revisions in the history, and it's showing me the differences, the full file lists, and, and all the details, right? Including the commit message, including all the, all the nice stuff, right? I wonder, ah, I wonder if I say view all files, is that going to help any? No. I'm wondering whether there is a... No. Uh, there is another GUI called Git GUI, which I can also invoke from here. So as you can see, there's there are a few things built in. This one is letting me look at, at the current state of the repo, right? That I have a change that is not committed, as well as do a lot more things here. Uh, to be honest, I'm not very familiar with these GUIs because I don't use them, uh, but it looks like there is plenty of stuff to, to explore here. I just wanted to mention that they exist and show some basic browsing functionality with Git K, because I do find it occasionally convenient because it allows you to move through the re revisions and look at the differences faster. And you can look at the differences across revisions, right? So I can look at the differences between two revisions that are two part, two revisions away, right? That kind of stuff. Okay, um, so to get back to the end, I can issue a git branch command to show what all the branches were. And notice this says that I'm currently in the head detached state. So I can just say git checkout main, and that gets me back to where we were before. Notice that it actually says, it just confirms where you were. Uh, actually, there is a git reflog command, reflog. Git maintains a log of all the references of where I've been in the, in the git tree. And it actually shows me where these references were. So this is this is just a convenient mechanism that Git provides to be able to be aware of the history of where you were. Okay. So now that we've kind of moved around and, and looked at what the different uh, versions of the, of the code were, now we can look at different repos. So I have this BCUG repo here, right? And if you remember, I created this repo by cloning it from GitHub. Well, let's go ahead and, and clone it again. I'm gonna clone BCUG to BCUG clone. Boom. And now I have two different repos. And if I go to the BCUG clone, it actually looks just like a copy 
of that repo that I cloned. And if I do a git log, I'll notice that it has all the commits that we've made, but notice that it doesn't have, if I do a git status, it doesn't have any files that were not committed, right? So I had the, the let's go back and look. So here I had a file called another foo that we've added but never committed. And notice when I cloned, all I, all I cloned was the repo. I did not clone any files that were in, in process that were not in the index. Does that make sense? Yes. So let's go back to this BCUG clone and we're gonna add some new stuff. Right. So I created a file called new stuff. And of course, git status tells me that I have this file and I can go ahead and do things to add it to the repo. So I'm just gonna say git add dot, which examines all the files and adds anything that happens to not be added yet. And I'm going to say git commit dash M. All right. Oh, it doesn't like typos, but it's smart enough to make to give me some suggestions. And new stuff is. All right. And now if I do a git status. Wait. The file was named new stuff with no space. Correct. And you just did an add of new stuff. Is that a comment? The commit dash M, the dash M parameter supplies a comment to the commit. Right? This this is we we covered this last time. Yeah. But um right. And if we do a git status, it shows now that we are all up to date and we're ahead of the original which is where we cloned from, right? And if I do a git log, uh, only one git. This makes sense? So here's the file new stuff and there's the comment add new stuff. Right, and before that, on February 8th, we did this, right? Okay, so what do we do? So now we have two repos, how do we get them back in sync? Now they're out of sync, right? Because here it says that our origin ended right here and we've added a new file. So I'm going to say git push to push my changes up to the origin. And this blows up. The reason why it blows up is actually at the very, very bottom. What it says is that the remote rejected us because this branch is currently checked out. As a matter of fact, as you guys remember, we happen to have a file that we've created. And so if I were able to push these changes to the original repo, the original repo now would have two sets of changes to reconcile. So therefore, this fails. So I'm just kind of showing this as an example of, of, on one hand, it's very easy to clone things. On the other hand, getting things back into the original repo may be slightly more complicated because you may have conflicts, right? But there's a few ways that we can mitigate this. 
So we can go back to BCUG, BCUG, right? And we can go back and do our checkout to someplace unknown, right? And put our head in the detached state just like we did before. And now we no longer have an unchecked in file that is at the end of the branch, right? Because here we're just kind of in a detached state in the middle of nowhere. And so if we go back to our BCUG clone and we do a git push, it succeeds. So now if we go back to the BCUG repo, where our head is still in a detached state, And if we look at the log, now we've added the new stuff as well. Right? But we still have this other file that we haven't checked in. So let's go ahead and do that. So notice that we're doing this in the old repo with the old file that we had here. Now we're all clean. And now notice what the sequence is, right? Even though we created this, uh, even though we created this file a month ago, we actually only committed this change now. And it was after that newer file that we've committed before, right? So what happened to our clone directory? Okay. Well, there's some changes in the in our origin repo that we haven't pulled in, right? How do we get those changes? We say git pull. And it says that, hey, there were no conflicts. It was able to fast forward merge. It added another foo from that repo. And now we've moved changes in both directions, right? From this repo to the repo that we cloned from and vice versa. Okay. So this is kind of a short way to work with remote repos. And we had to jump through some hoops because we really cloned two repos with working directories, which is not the usual pattern. The usual pattern is that you have a bare repo, what's called a bare repository, which doesn't have a working directory. The way that you get a bare repository is you say, git clone dash dash bear b c u g underscore master uh, let's call this bear well that git is is the usual extension that you give to bear git repos so I'm cloning from BCUG to something called BCUG bear, right? And if we look at the BCUG bear, it looks like it has a whole bunch of Git specific files and directories. It doesn't have a working directory actually. 
what it has is very similar to what is stored in the .git directory in our original repo. Right. Here there are a few things because we've been working in this repo that didn't get copied over, but the basic things like branches and configs and all those other things got copied. We'll look at the internal structure of Git. Git actually does not hide its internal structures very much. It makes them very available and, and actually it's a, you're able to manipulate them with all kinds of tools that come with Git. Um, but so now what we can do is we can say git clone bcug underscore bear to bc2, let's say, All right? And now we have a normal Git repo that we can work in. And because it was cloned from this bare repo, we're never going to have conflicts pushing back to it. So that's the way to go. If you want to have multiple repos and you kind of want them in a tree structure, you make the top level one bare. This is what GitHub does. This is kind of the centralized model. There are definitely ways to move changes between repos without doing push and pull. So one of the things, so let, let's go ahead and do that. Um, it's 8.37. Bill, did you want me to stop at a particular time? No, you're, you're the only other speaker here. I got nothing to do tonight. Oh, okay. I thought you had you had a no, thing no, 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 no. You, you two guys are doing just fine. Okay. Um, so I'm going to create some of the newest stuff here. And if we look at this, I am kind of ahead of my original bare repo, right? So I could just do a git push, right? Or I can do a git format patch. And I'm going to say I want the one latest commit. I could say dash three, dash four, dash five to get multiple commits. And then I want these to be from the head, which is the latest revision. And I want them to output them to a directory called patches. And it says, oh, okay. Well, I created you the newest patch in this directory. And if I go look at that file, It looks just like an e a formatted email that contains the differences that were introduced by this commit. So I can take this file and send it via email, copy it across the network, carried on a USB stick or anything else I want, right? So let me get a copy of it. And then I'm gonna go back to a directory that I originally did things in, right? And of course this patch is not here at all. As a matter of fact, it's, it's even missing other things, right? But I could say git 
apply. this patch and now if I do a get status, it tells me that, hey, I've added this file, right? And I can go ahead and add it and commit it or or I can say get am. Is anybody else seeing a frozen screen? I'm seeing a frozen screen. Yeah. Oh, are you guys not no longer seeing me? Well, yeah, I see, see you, but you always see is git space apply dot dot forward slash new. Yeah, and it's frozen at the moment. Yeah. Shall I stop sharing and reshare? Yeah, why not? Give it a shot. Well, it just, well, it just, it just caught up. Oh, well. Oh. Uh, Network let's problems. Do, let's, let's do that again. <laughs> Okay, so, all right. So I did a get apply newest patch and then I removed the, the patch, but I'll do it again. So if I do a get status now, it shows me that I have this new file called new, more new stuff that I created in, in the other repo, right? And if I wanted to, I could add it and commit it or I could remove this and instead of a, doing a git apply, I can do a git apply merge. And now, there is nothing to commit, but it actually made, went ahead and committed it with the same information that the previous commit had that the patch had, right? So there's two ways to merge things in. I could either bring patches one at a time, and there's actually even, even more capabilities in terms of applying patches in a partial or interactive way. But in this case, I went ahead and said, hey, apply the patch and commit it. So it's fully in this repo, okay? So we've kind of played around with remotes and there's other ways to do re get remote stuff over the network. So you could access repos that are on remote machines via SSH, or there is a built-in Git server that you could run. But if, the, if your remotes are located across the network and across firewalls, you would have to figure out ways to get through the firewalls. Right. Um, but maybe what we should try to play with next is GitHub and see how we can get one of these remotes on GitHub. Would that be of interest or folks have other suggestions? We may not be able to finish. We only have 15 minutes. No, you can always start and finish up next time. You know, hey, interesting stuff. So, all right. I'm not, I'm not hearing a whole lot of questions. So either this is old. Tr trivially simple or lots of folks are confused. I'm hoping that maybe at, at best it's a, it's a mixture of some. Yeah, probably. Yep. I yeah, just totally. looked mixture, up books just... on Amazon to find something so that I can work through this by reviewing your video and trying a book. And I can see places where I want to use this for version control. And, uh, and so I'm going to have to go back through it. And so it didn't seem appropriate to ask too many questions because I'm going to review it and then I may have questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to be in the same boat. If we continue next month, um, we could do a review and bring questions in. I'm certainly happy to talk about it next time or talk about it online. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's let's pop this in an incognito window and and go to GitHub.com. You know, can I interject something uh, with regard to your 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 dilemma of whether people are responding or or asleep or whatever? I posted the um, link of your first presentation last month, and uh, the 
the continuity. Well, thank you so very much for doing that. Yeah, I, I think the continuity is important uh, yeah. because you you jumped in at something that other people may not be aware of. So right. if there are any guests here not familiar with the uh, YouTube channel we have, I posted a, a channel link and a link specifically to Sergi's intro. It and it's been a month. Sergi knows what he did last month, but none of the rest of us remember what he did. So it might be a good idea to, you know, to review that piece of it all together. And hopefully Bill and I will get together with this uh, this recording and I'll follow up with a recording on your presentation tonight, Sergi. I think the work that you're doing is absolutely invaluable, Fred. Like this is just, just incredible. Well, I'm trying, like the, the, I'm trying the, the, to relate it as you know in the Windows world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just think it's an incredible value to have to have a record of of what happened in these in these sessions. Well, I I, I think they're very valuable. I mean, uh, yep. I mean, go through this stuff once, even if you guys are up on this stuff, it would be incredible for, for me to understand. You know, I, I have to go whatever you write on the on the forum. I have to go through two, three, five times before it sinks in, and then. I try to relate it to Windows, and once in a while it does connect. Believe me, it really does. It make it makes a lot. Of well, you know, a lot of what we're talking about right at the moment is is not really operating system specific, right? I, I Other than how you move between directories and things like that. I understand that, but you know what they're doing with kids now. Um, I yeah. I've been teaching my uh, grand nephew Scratch. Mm -hmm. And they have, they develop communities at an early, early age, right from the get go. Yeah. Call it a repository or not, but they share whatever and they create. But if they take somebody else's idea, they use the term remix. So they give them credit indirectly, you know, Creative Commons attribution. With Scratch, they call it a remix. Same thing like in audio, they'll take somebody else's file and they'll, they'll do something to it. They call it a remix. So um, if I use any of your stuff, sir, be considered a remix. <laughs> All right. So we're going to hit sign up here. Uh, um, Gilbert just asked, Gilbert asked if there's a YouTube channel. Gilbert, yes. It was announced via Groups IO distributions. Fred created it. If you search for Brookdale Computer User Group, okay? Brookdale Computer Users Group on YouTube, you should find our channel. I just but you also should have gotten a distribution from groups.io that included the links, including today or yesterday. Yeah, I haven't Gordon. caught up with all the groups.io mail yet, so that's probably it. I just posted it in the uh, chat. Okay. All right, so I'm going to give it a bogus email address that's in my domain, so I get the email anyway, because I control the, the email. And then it wants me to create a password, and... I'm just going to do a quick... I'll just tell you a quick uh, new version story from the olden punch card days. We had a guy who liked to just take the deck straight out of the card punch and write latest version on top of it. Well, that was wonderful until there were two or three latest versions in your hands, and then you didn't know what the hell you were dealing with. So there was, you go. We got we got stepped on our on our own crawler a few times with that. That's what date and times are for. So I generated a password. I am going to hit continue here, and it wants me to enter a username, and I'm going to use this as the username as well. Would you like to receive product updates? Hell no, I receive enough junk mail. <laughs> now this is a, this is actually interesting and puzzling. Apparently, I'm supposed to solve some puzzles. Uh, to identify things that look the same here. None of them look the same. Uh, I think this is it. 
I like that. No, come on. Oh, this one. They actually make it pretty hard. And now I can hit create account. And now it emails me a code. So I have to go back to the real window and get the email. Ah, my GitHub launch code is here. I'm just gonna blow through these questions real quick. I don't wanna do anything special here. You guys can do what you wish, but you can always add these things later. And I wanna continue for free. Now we get a beautiful video of entering a new world. And now I have, um, a brand new account and doesn't have any repositories at all. Now this is, so we can create an empty repo here and then push things to it if we want to do it that way. That seems like a good way to go. So I'm going to create a repo called test 001. You can obviously name things in a more meaningful way. Uh, you can always do it public or private. I'm not going to add any readme or license files or anything else, but you can, and it's probably a decent idea. But I'm going to skip all of that and just hit create a repo. And now it provides some information here about how I can get things into this repo but I'm actually going to just create a file called readme.md. There seems to be a lot of handholding here in, in the comments, which is really nice. There is, there it, GitHub does a really, really nice job of providing a lot of documentation. Right. Hey. And I'm not going to add any more comments than that. And because it's a .md file, it has a preview now. So this pound sign says, hey, use this as, as a title in title font, hence this in the preview. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a commit here. And now I have a repo with a file and all of that. Oh, GitHub used to allow you to use your username and a password with the commands Fair, somewhat recently, although I think this may have been as long as a couple of years ago, they stopped allowing passwords to be used. So you have to do something else. You And so here you have to go into settings so this is very GitHub specific. Other, other Git services providers may do something else. But one of the ways to do this is to use, to go down here into developer settings. On the left, I'm gonna click on developer settings. And then I'm gonna click on personal access tokens. And I'm gonna get a classic token. So this token is used just like a password, except for for access from the command line. So I'm gonna leave kind of the defaults and I'm gonna click this repo button and I think that's all that's needed. At least that's all that was needed when I tried it last time. I'm gonna generate this token and it says, hey, please make sure you copy this personal access token because it'll never show it to you again. If you lose it, you'll just have to generate a new one. It's not a real problem, but 
And now I got it copied. I use this little thing called Parcelite that saves all kinds of things, including my password and the username and this token. Um, okay, so let's go back to our um, Go back to our repo. All right, and we're pretty much done here with GitHub. All right, the rest of it we can we can continue to work here if we want to use the built-in editors and the web-based interface. There is all kinds of other things that you could do that are around project management with GitHub that I'm not going to explore today. And instead, we're going to go here. Hey, Sergey. Sergey. Yeah. Uh, yep. With what you just did on the with what you just did on the GitHub piece, that's yep. that's OS ag agnostic. From if, if I'm absolutely correctly. So absolutely. You have, so you have a GitHub repository that you created through GitHub, but whether you access it from a Linux client, a Mac client. Windows client, you can still go against the same repository. Absolutely. There is nothing, there is nothing OS specific about that. Right. And there's really nothing OS specific about Git, except for how you might move be between directories, but Git understands directory trees. You, you cannot do something that, for example, if you have some files on a C drive and some files on a D drive, in Windows, there is, as far as I know, there is no way for Git to manage that as a single repo. But you can certainly manage them as multiple repos. Yeah. Right? It is uh, on the agno agnos agnostic side. GitHub or Git also handles the line ending codes of where the, your OS specific line ending codes. Yep. Okay. So it's, that's and, transparent to you as well. And just thinking yep. about the, uh, you know, some of the, I guess, overwhelmingly, you'd be dealing with text files. Does this work equally as well? Everything that you've been doing, you've been adding. You start off with a blank file, add a line, save it, make the commit, add another line, change an existing line. How about if you started off with a large file and you were systematically going through and deleting lines? If you deleted too many, can you go back to the earlier version then? Absolutely, 100%. There is, okay. there is absolutely nothing. Uh, so let's look in the, in the BCUG repo. Uh, were, and we'll pull up that GUI that we used to browse previous revisions. Hoping you can see that. And there is lines being added. I'm looking to see if we can find some lines being deleted. Here's some lines. Here's a deleted line, for example. Um, here's a deleted line and a, a few of them, right? Okay. And yeah, it is absolutely, all, all the changes are preserved. As a matter of fact, Git simply retains a complete snapshot of the file as it was at the time when the commit was done. So anytime you have anything committed, it's there. It would take effort to destroy a committed file. Great, thanks. Uh, it's could, just, could it's I... just getting a little scary because I started to understand some of the things. I'm saying, wait a minute, there's got to be a problem here. There's no problem. It's it's the magic is incredibly powerful, and if we get to playing with Git internals, we'll we'll look at that at how Git actually does this. It is absolutely inspirationally magical. Could I just could I just review something? Yeah. What types of files can be managed this way? Get not videos or pictures, right? Git absolutely does not know or care. A file is what Git calls a blob. It is a it is a sequence of bytes. So if you so, if you want so to store, you absolutely can store a video, a picture, or anything else you want. Word document, Excel uh, spreadsheet. Sure, sure. Git doesn't know and doesn't care. 
but you can't look at deleted lines or stuff you, like that. What does it do when you, I you, ask? You can't for the do diffs across a binary files. Now there is a tool out there you can convert uh, dot dot docx files and other stuff into ASCII files, and then you can uh, get the extract the ASCII of both files and then diff them. But that might not be as valuable or, as you might think. Or you could probably use facilities within Office tools to compare two versions of files because Office yeah, for uh, for something like that, yes. But I'm thinking because more Office of, understands the internals of the formats, right? Yeah. That that is wow. true. I'm but the, uh, I'm thinking of like JPEG or something like that. You 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 might have some real serious problems. I mean JPEG. I guess you could pull up pictures side by side, superimpose them, play with transparency. Yeah. If, uh, you know, if if you happen to be editing them in something that keeps history, like Photoshop or GIMP, you you might be able to yeah. actually examine steps steps the, in the history. Yeah, so, with one, the tool I was mentioning, you can actually teach GitHub to use it for its diff for that file type. There are, there are all kinds of capabilities of adding smarts to Git and GitHub. To be honest, a lot of them I'm not familiar with. But So uh, if we go here and click on this code thing, it shows me the name of the repo that I can use to clone it. And if I just go here and I say git clone and paste this business, right? And I can remove the, or I could say, or I could just give it a name explicitly to clone it into. And now it wants a username for GitHub. And I use this, and it wants a password. So there's all kinds of ways to mitigate the whole username password authentication failed. Oh, it's it's because I used got it. Uh, because I used the account password and not the token that I generated. What I should have used was the token, right? So first name, first username. Yeah, first I need the username. And then I need to use the token as the password. And it's specifically, that is why I had to go get the token because Notice the message that says support for password authentication was removed in 2021. Uh, what, so I can only what was use the, the name of that tool that you were using for storing all of that little stuff. Uh, hold on, I'm blowing this here. Okay. Uh, this desktop tool? Yeah. It's, it's called Parcel Light. Parcel light. Can you put it in the can you put it in the chat, please? It's kind of old, but it's a clipboard manager. Yeah, last update was in 2017. It's it's in the Ubuntu repos. So you just app apt install parcel light. But yeah, I can put it in the chat if I can find where the chat went. I'm using copy queue as the clipboard manager. Works there great. you go. Yeah, yeah, there's there are multiples out there. Yeah. Hey guys, just as a time check, uh, we're you know passing. I use something called Clip Man. Works pretty well. All right, whenever's convenient, Sergey. Uh, this is probably just as convenient as ever because it, I don't seem to be able to figure out why I can't log in. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'll figure I'll figure that out and, and share with you next time. That's so cool. we we are just to kind of underline or put a dotted line of where we are. We created a brand new repo in our brand new account, but we haven't really done anything with it locally. So our next task would be to clone the repo locally and prove that we can get the contents of the repo as well as 
be able to uh, push and pull files back and forth, right? That's and great. maybe and maybe we can show how to do that on multiple machines next time. Very cool, right? Yep. Okay. Thank now, you, Sergey. Thank I'll... you, Dick. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, thank you very much. As usual, sure. it's all hours, I think. It's been Great fun, evening. as always. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Thank you so much. See you, see you all next time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Have a good, good one. Enjoy. You okay, bye.